Lianos Pixar, uh, typical German name. And he's going to talk about the real world multi center prospective registry using the direct flow medical transcatheter aortic valve system for the treatment of severe aortic stenosis, a comparison with the Discover trial. Thank you, dear Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, and dear friends from the press. Good morning. My name is Tilianos Pixaras. I work as an interventional cardiologist in Essen, Germany. These are my disclosures. So we had two main goals in this study. The first was to assess the performance of the direct flow medical transcatheter aortic valve implantation system in a multicenter real world experience. And of course, the second one was to compare these findings with the Discover CMARC trial. We performed this study in a high-risk patient population which had severe aortic stenosis and they were all candidates to transcatheter aortic valve implantation. The primary endpoint of this study was the all-cause mortality at 30 days of follow-up. And in addition, we compared our results with the findings of the Discover trial. So this slide summarizes uh, the procedure, the implantation procedure. In the first panel, you see how uh, the transcatheter uh, implantation system passes through the aortic valve. Then the uh, direct flow medical valve is uh, deployed inside the left ventricle by inflating the upper and the lower ring with a mixture of saline and contrast. Afterwards, the upper ring of the valve uh, is deflated, and with these three uh, positioning wires, the valve is uh, pulled back in the proper position. Then again here, the upper ring is reinflated with a mixture of contrast and saline. And if the position is not just as optimal, we can still deflate the upper ring, move again a little bit the positioning wires, and then optimize the position of the valve to have an optimal result. So what we saw from our results and the comparison with the Discover trial, our population was uh, elderly patients with a uh, mean age of 81 plus minus uh, approximately five years of age. It was significantly younger with respect to the Discover trial. However, our patient population had a significant higher prof risk profile. As we can see from the lung disease, advanced New York Heart Association class and uh, lower ejection fraction uh, rates with respect to the Discover trial, which was all uh, in favor of the Discover trial in this case. From this real world experience, the um, overall mortality, which was the primary endpoint, was approximately 1.9% in our study population, which was not significantly different with respect to the findings from the Discover trial. Likewise, myocardial infarction stroke and major vascular complication rates were not significant, uh, significantly different from the Discover trial. The composite safety endpoint was also not significantly different, and this was based to the uh, Valve uh, Research Consortium criteria and was a composite from death, myocardial infarction, stroke, stage three acute kidney injury, and major vascular complications in 30 days. So what are the main clinical implications from our experience? First of all, the clinical setting. This is a study that was performed in real world, elderly, high-risk patients with severe aortic stenosis. Second, the procedure. In all of these patients, this direct flow medical prosthesis, which is repositionable, has been used. Our results demonstrate also low mortality rates at 30 days. And of course, the comparison with the Discover trial, which was the CMARC trial that introduced the Discover flow medical, the di uh, direct flow medical um, valve, gave similar rates with respect to early outcome, safety, and also efficacy. With this, I conclude my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, um, could you just explain what, what, were, what are the differences between the technique in, in what you're doing and the DISCOVER trial. Well, I didn't get the description of the DISCOVER trial well enough. So uh, the technique which we used, uh, it was exactly the same as the DISCOVER trial. 
Uh, we must underline that uh, the discovered trial has been performed to 100 patients, and the first 25 patients uh, have been excluded for, uh, from the interim analysis because the, the, uh, these patients were um, belonging to the uh, initial uh, learning curve. That means that uh, the, um, the technique has been perfectionized during these first 25 cases in practice. Uh, actually, the uh, comparison we performed was based on the comparison with the remainder 75 patients from the Discover trial and not to the whole uh, population of the Discover trial um, because of this but limitation. Is the, differ is the difference between that uh, you have a repositional deflatable ring that permits you to re retrieve and reposition. Is that the difference in the technique? That's all I wanted to know. So uh, the main difference is in the inner curve technique. That means that uh, the positioning wire, which is first being pulled back, is based to the fact that the um, prosthesis is being inflated totally inside the left ventricle. So in the beginning of this experience, the prosthesis has been inflated uh, after balloon predilatation in the um, valve positioning. Uh, afterwards, uh, the operators uh, perfectionized this technique and they inflated the valve inside the left ventricle first. They deflated afterwards the upper ring and then they tried to pull it back. Right. Please. Good morning. Melissa Walton, Shirley with theheart.org. So the entire point to this is to try to decrease paravalvular leak. Is that the issue? And do you have any data about that? I mean, it, you know, with the mitral clip, it's beautiful because you can test it, position it, do a TEE, and then look at the, the leak. Is that the same issue with this, or just ease of positioning? I don't understand the point. So um, the main uh, originality of this device is that it's repositionable. Um, with respect to the current clinical practice that we have um, balloon expandable or self-expandable valve, and afterwards we can have some aortic regurgitation which is being um, sometimes treated with uh, balloon post-dilatation. In this case, you can just deflate the upper ring, reposition the valve, then control again with angiography, just a little bit of contrast injection in the aortic root until you are not happy with the aortic regurgitation afterwards. Of course, the aortic regurgitation is one, one, only one of the parameters that we're checking. We're checking positioning, we're checking if uh, the valve is not covering the uh, coronary ostia and so on. So is there an issue with when you inflate this upper ring after you deflate it and remove the contrast, is there any room for play that later on down the road you might have an issue with that? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, the inflation and deflation is totally internal to the catheters, so the contrast doesn't uh, leave actually um, the whole system inside the body. You just have to deflate and de inflate uh, the contrast and the... Um, the is that your question? That's not really my question. My right. question is, you know, when you expand something yeah. and then you take all the contrast out, looks like there would be some play in the upper ring, so later on there might be movement or shift, or is that a potential concern? We try to avoid this thing by doing the um, balloon predilation always before positioning this valve. Uh, of course, uh, there could be limits in this technique. Um, until now, we didn't have any problems in this series. Of course, this um, is a relatively small series of patients, 105 patients. Um, performed in uh, 10 different centers in Europe. However, we did not notice this kind of um, problem until now. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so final question, please. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. Uh, did you have, uh, what was your percentage of, pa of patients that are procedures that were successful? Uh, or did you have any cases in which you could not do the implantation? So um, in, this case, in, this, in this series of 105 patients, uh, we had uh, just uh, one problem. Uh, one patient uh, did not uh, succeed, it and we had to switch to another uh, device. And this was uh, mainly due to heavy calcifications uh, after uh, balloon post-dilatation. This is a percentage of device success of more than 99% in this series, and it actually confirms the 99% device success from the Discover trial.